Welcome to Brave Conversations. I am your host, Autumn, and today we are going to be talking about Andrew, the first disciple that Jesus called and the disciple who led others to Jesus. So we are going to explore why Jesus chose Andrew in the first place. What made Andrew the ideal disciple for Jesus to choose? In this video, we are going to explore Andrew's life, um, just get some background information on him, his story, uh, you know, go over some key moments in the Bible that he is featured in. We're going to analyze his actions and see what lessons we can learn from him. So let's get into it. All right. So for each episode, I'm going to do like a character profile. And we're going to do this almost as if we are FBI agents giving a background information on like some serial killer that we're investigating or something. That's what popped in my head when I created this. I'm pretty sure you can use character profiles for any other situation, but you know, my mind just went to that first. Anyway, um, so of course, Andrew's name is Andrew. Um, usually in the Bible, it's always like Andrew, Bar Jonah, um, and then Bar is just mean like son. So he's, he's saying Andrew is the son of Jonah, or sometimes Jonah is referred to John. We don't know much about his father, him or Simon, uh, Simon Peter's father. They don't talk about his father much, but we do know that his name was Jonah or John um, and that they were fishermen. Both Andrew and Simon Peter were fishermen. I'm assuming their father were fishermen because usually back in those times, you took the job of your parents or most specifically your father because the men worked and the women stayed at home. But you usually just followed in the footsteps of your father. So. I'm assuming that their father was a fisherman as well. His alias, though, Andrew's alias, he is coined the first disciple or the first called. Um, This is also um, you might hear him being referred to as the protoclete, which protoclete just means the first called or um, the first apostle. Andrew's name is actually a Greek form of his name. Andrew is the Greek form of his real Hebrew name which was Andreas and Andreas translates to man, um, which also means like manly, brave, courageous. The, your name held a lot of meaning. Your, your name kind of identified what type of person you, what you were back in those times. Names held such importance um, and they hold such importance in the Bible. You can see that in the old Testament when Jesus, um, not Jesus, well, Jesus will, will explain the whole, like Jesus in the Old Testament, New Testament, way down the line. But when God changed Abram's name to Abraham, or when he changed Jacob's name to Israel, God changed their names. And in that moment, they changed into the person that he created them to be. So names held a lot of meaning. So for Andrew to be named, um, so his name to mean like manly, strong, brave, courageous, As we, you know, dig dig deep into his story, you can actually see those characteristics within him. And maybe potentially that is not potentially that is what Jesus saw in Andrew. And that's why he chose him. But we'll get into that later. Interesting enough, Andrew was actually John the Baptist's disciple before John the Baptist introduced Jesus to Andrew. And then Andrew then became um, was chosen to be Jesus' disciple. That is mentioned in the book of John. It's not mentioned in the other three Gospels. But um, I just find that interesting. And that actually explains why he was so eager to follow Jesus without hesitation when Jesus introduced himself and, you know, told basically everybody who he was. And then Andrew was just like, okay, bet. I believe you. Let's go. Let's do it. If he was John the Baptist's disciple first, Um, It makes sense because John the Baptist probably was, you know, preparing, like giving Andrew lessons that, um, you know, John the Baptist was just sent to prepare the way for the Messiah to come. So for John to explain, John was probably explaining to Andrew that, you know, the Messiah is coming. um, And once John saw Jesus and was like, behold, That is the son of God. That is the Messiah. Andrew was like, oh, okay, this is the guy you've been talking about for ages now. And so, you know, it it took no hesitation for him to follow along with Jesus when Jesus was like, come on, follow me. You know, you probably know Andrew through his brother, Simon Peter, 
who became a very significant person in the Bible. In fact, I feel like um, Andrew is overshadowed by his brother because everybody everybody knows Peter, but you know you don't really hear about Andrew much. But they were brothers um, by blood. Key personality traits that we can take from Andrew is that he was eager. He was quick to follow Jesus and bring others to Jesus. And he was also humble. He often worked um, behind the shadows. He wasn't really in the spotlight. Like I said, he was kind of overshadowed by Peter. Peter was always getting all the glory. You know, Peter was always mentioned in all four of the Gospels, but you don't hear much about Andrew. So he was behind the scenes type of guy. He didn't really like being in the spotlight like that. He just wanted to do the work and get the work done. He was also resourceful, and we'll get into that when we discuss his key moments in the Bible. You you can see very various moments where Andrew is the one bringing people to Jesus. Um, so he was an evangelist. He brought people to Jesus. He made people aware of the good news. He was the one that introduced Peter to Jesus. So Peter wouldn't even have had his encounter with Jesus without his brother Andrew. And so that is another characteristic of Andrew. Now, we all know that the disciples were ordinary people. They weren't just, they weren't perfect in no shape or form. Only Jesus was perfect. But some of his negative traits were that he was overzealous at times. He was always eager, um, you know, to do God's work. But at times he didn't, he was very like impulsive. He didn't really analyze the situation before he would act. And so he was like kind of overzealous in some moments, not really, you know, reading the the room or you know understanding the situation before he would do stuff um and I feel like also because he likes working behind the scenes he had an underestimated influence like he was very good at evangelizing but because he didn't want to be in the spotlight um he kind of dimmed his light at times like just imagine if he was you know very outspoken very extroverted very um just out there with his influence, how the, just like the amount of influence he could have had over people and not in a negative way, but like, you know, the amount of people, influx of people and groups that he could bring to Jesus while Jesus was here on earth with us. And he was also hesitant. Um, where boldness is needed, because you kind of need boldness if you're going to be a disciple of Christ. Um, he was probably hesitant to really put himself out there. Um, again, that kind of intertwines with his underestimated influence, um, him being behind the scenes. You know, for me personally, I actually struggle with that with this YouTube. Like, I want people to watch, of course. I want to grow on YouTube, but at the same time, I don't. It's because, like, I don't want to be seen in public. I don't want to be noticed. I don't want to be um, in, like, out there like that you know I kind of want to do my work still grow the channel but also still be in the shadows and that's just not possible if you're being called to share Jesus's good news and we we know that you can't really stay behind the scenes and hide when, when you're doing that you know and so Andrew I kind of did myself with Andrew in this moment and some key skills here he was a good networker that is something I'm not like I said I don't like to be seen I don't like to be outspoken like that but he was good with networking people. He brought people to Jesus. But, um, you know, just also, it, that's a skill to be able to bring people to Jesus, different types of people, not just the people you hang out with. People from all different walks of life. He was good at recognizing potential. He recognized a need in people. He recognized when people were being serious about meeting Jesus. And so he would initiate that contact and that connection. Um, but you kind of have to have discernment because some people are about their life, but not really. You know what I mean? So anyway, he also had faithful obedience. Um, it When Jesus told him to follow me, he did it without hesitation. There wasn't no like, uh, are you really the Messiah, though? Like, mm, I don't know about this. Like he was down for it he was like let's go this is the messiah and again that could stem from the fact that he did walk with john the baptist first and john the baptist of course knew his assignment he knew that he was not the messiah that he was just leading the way for the messiah to come and so that's what he preached that somebody was coming the messiah was coming and that he is just leading the way and so when you hear that all the time and then of course that happens you kind of have no hesitation you don't you don't question it because you believe it, but it does take belief within that person to 
just believe what you're being taught because like even if you hear it all the time it takes you to believe it in order for you to do something without like go with something without hesitation or questioning it so that is andrew's character profile now let's get into the moment that andrew was called by jesus to follow him so this moment is actually detailed in all four of the gospels uh matthew mark luke and john and Each disciple tells it in a different way. Matthew and Mark's um, depiction of this moment is actually really similar. Like, I think it's actually word for word similar. Um, Luke has some some differences. And John, I feel like, is the more is the most specific. Um, So I'm just going to read Matthew's, Luke's and then John's. And then we're going to piece together this moment, the moment that Jesus first called Andrew. So we're going to start with um matthew 4 verses 18 through 20 and it says and i'm reading from the uh new king james version because i like that version right now i i switch between versions if you watch past um videos like i'm i'm always reading from some new version so choose what version works best for you but this is what's working for me right now and it says in jesus walking by the sea of galilee saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. And so that was Matthew version of the calling. Mark um, kind of verbatim says the same thing. Um, We're going to switch over to Luke's version And you can find Luke's version in Luke 5, um, verses 1 through 11. And Luke details this as, So it was, as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, Gennesaret, read it for yourself, And saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats and the he that they're referring to is Jesus. So then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me. For I am a sinful man, O Lord. I'm going to stop right there. So you see in Luke's version that he doesn't really mention. Oh, and in Matthew's that they don't really. um, Well, actually, no. Matthew mentions Andrew. Luke doesn't mention Andrew at all. He kind of just focuses on Simon Peter. But Simon Peter and Andrew work together as fishermen. So we can assume that Andrew was present during all this time. Um, And the partners that they signaled to the other boat to come help them once they had all their fish. Uh is assuming that that is Andrew, I mean, that is James and John, who were also fishermen and who worked with Simon Peter and Andrew uh, during that time in Capernaum. Based off this scene in Luke, we can assume that Andrew was present when Jesus told Simon to cast the nets and all that fish was there. And we're going to go to John because John is a little more specific. Now, John's version is completely different from everybody else's. His actually start off with after this is like right after John the Baptist has baptized Jesus and, you know, the dove and the Holy Spirit. And God said, this is my son who I'm very well pleased. And, you know, that it just kind of started off Jesus's revealing of himself, revealing to people that he is the Messiah. Of course, John says, behold, this is the one that I am, you know, paved the way for. This is the son of God. And so Andrew is present, of course, because Andrew is a disciple of John the Baptist first. And so this is what John says. This is in John 1, 
verses 35 to 42. Again, the next day, John the Baptist stood with two of his disciples and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, behold, the lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and seeing them following said to them, what do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say when translated teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the 10th hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is trans translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. If we were to put all of these versions of this moment together, this is kind of how I'm, I'm getting this all went down. Okay, so we start off with John, which is, is right after John the Baptist baptizes Jesus. And, you know, it's revealed that Jesus is the Messiah. Andrew, one of the two disciples that was with John and heard this, um, some speculate that the other disciple that was with him was John, the disciple. But we'll get into that when we talk about him, him and his episode. But we're just focused on Andrew. So Andrew was one of the two disciples that heard uh, John the Baptist call Jesus the Lamb of God. And so hearing this, he's like, oh, this must be the man that, you know, I've been hearing John the Baptist preach about because, you know, this is what he's who he's talking about all the time. So they begin to follow Jesus after they hear him preach a little bit after he's baptized. You know, they're asking basically when they ask, where are you staying? That's them basically asking like, hey, do you have time to chat? Like, where are you? Where are you living where we can, have, you know, sit some time aside and talk? So Jesus says, come and see. So Jesus leads them to where he's staying and they spend the whole day with him, him, uh, Andrew and the other disciple. And they spend the whole day with him. I'm assuming probably asking him questions. You know, Jesus probably explaining, you know, more lessons, explaining who he is. And so that really solidified for Andrew that this is the Messiah. And so Andrew is in his eagerness because we say he was very eager He's like, oh, my goodness, I have to introduce you to my brother, Simon. Hold on. Come on. We finna go get Simon. Now, I don't know if maybe like this is the next day or this happened within the same day. But then I'm assuming that the next scene, the scene that is written in Luke happens. Luke and Mark, where Jesus is preaching and he, he has gained a crowd because, you know, he's preaching the word. It's hitting people. It's hitting. He's spitting. And so he asks one of the fishermen at the boats, like, hey, can I take your boat and, you know, sail out a little bit so that I can, you know, talk to everybody. So he gets on Simon Peter's boat and he's still preaching and Simon's there and Andrew's there and all the other disciples before they realize they were disciples are there and they're hearing him speak. And then Jesus turns to Simon's like, cast your net. And Simon's like, well, we've been out here all day and we haven't caught anything, but. You know, I've been hearing you speak, and then Andrew over here talking about you, the Messiah and all. So, you know what? I'm going a, I'm to a listen, and we're going to see what happens. So then, of course, they cast the net. All this fish come up. They ask John and James, like, hey, come help us with this net. It's too much. And then from that miracle that Jesus just performed, Simon Peter's like, oh, my God, Andrew, you right. This is the Messiah. And Simon's like, oh, depart from me. I'm a sinner. And, you know, we'll get into that with, with Peter's story, but. That is how I'm assuming the scene went down when Jesus called Andrew. He called the other three disciples as well at the same time. But Andrew, if from John and Luke's and Matthew's version put together, it seems like Andrew was the first to meet Jesus. Andrew was the first to sit down with him and, you know, chat with him, really get to know him and really just solidify his faith that Jesus is the Messiah and without hesitation, left his profession, left what was probably expected from him, from his father, and was like, I'm going to follow this man, forget what anybody else says. Come on, Simon, we about to go. And that's how that went down. Now, there's not much to say. There's not many scenes um, and moments in the Bible that 
details Andrew specifically. Of course, there are many moments of the disciples doing things and Andrew was disciples. So you can assume that he was talking and referring to Andrew also doing these things. But there are two key moments within the Bible that I do want to highlight and really just break down. And the first moment is a famous moment that I feel like everybody knows. And it is titled The Feeding of the 5,000. So bear with me because when I was doing my own personal Bible study, the Lord brought forth something, but this is a revelation that God was giving me while I was preparing for this episode. And this actually talks about Jesus sending the 12 disciples out to preach his word and to do miracles and everything. So I'm going to read the verse first. Luke 9 verses 1 through 3 that I'm going to read. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said to them, take nothing for the journey, neither staffs, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics apiece. So, he basically sent his 12 disciples. He paired them in twos. So everybody had a buddy and he basically told them, don't take nothing for this journey. OK, don't take no staff, which was a walking stick. Don't take a bag, which you can you can kind of re- like re- envision as luggage, like with your clothes and stuff or like with your toiletries and stuff that you would take on vacation. Don't take that. Don't take bread. Don't take no food. Don't take no money to buy food and all that. And do not have another set of clothing, a piece for y'all. Just take what you got on right now. Don't take anything and go out. I give you the authority to cast out demons and to cure the sick and to preach the word and to spread my word and, you know, give give the good news to people. So, like, y'all got to realize, like, he was basically, they had little to nothing when they did these missionary trips they had no provision. Keep that in mind once once I really break this down, this key moment of feeding, feeding the 5,000, right? So we're at the scene where Jesus sends out his 12 disciples, right? He's like, go, spread the word. I give you authority. I give you power. Don't take any provision with you. Take what you got right now and go do, go do what I just told you. So they go, right? So while they're doing that, Jesus is preaching, you know, he gets in little, little, little disputes with the with the um, Jewish leaders in Jerusalem. And he's doing all these marvelous miracles and, you know, really gaining attention, of course, you know, debating with the Jewish leaders and the Pharisees and things. And um, this is all while the 12 are also going around the region of Galilee and they're, you know, also preaching the word, also hearing, um, curing the diseases and casting out demons because Jesus gave them the, the authority to. Uh, and then in the midst of them both, you know, spreading the word of God, you have John the Baptist getting beheaded by King Herod. Um, if you want to know why he was beheaded, you'll have to read that yourself. But basically, John the Baptist is murdered and beheaded. And so John the Baptist's disciples of course, take his body after he's beheaded, they go bury it, and they bring the news of his demise to Jesus. Jesus, you know, just found out that his cousin, um, who he probably loved and, you know, spent a lot of time growing up with, has died. Um, Jesus knows that this is to come. He knows what this means, that, you know, his, his mission is, you know, coming to fruition. His purpose is coming Um, And time is dwindling. The disciples come back and they, you know, they're like all excited. They probably don't even know that John the Baptist was beheaded yet. They come to Jesus. Of course, they return from their mission that he sent them on. And they're just like, you know, telling him like, this is what we did. You know, we, um, we, uh, we did, we cared, we cared this person, we cared that person. We had all these people listening to us. Good news, good news. But, you know, Jesus just, just found out his cousin died. So he's kind of sad and grieving. But at the same time, he's probably happy that his disciples followed his word and that they were able with his power and authority to do the work of his father. This is Mark 6 verses 30. Then the apostles gathered to Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said to them, come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest for a while. 
for there were many coming and going and they did not even have time to eat. So they departed to a deserted place in the boat by themselves. But the multitudes saw them departing and many knew him, him referring to Jesus and ran there on foot from all the cities. They arrived before them and came together to him, him being Jesus and Jesus when he came out and he saw all these people, I'm like paraphrasing now, he was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep, not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. And he also um, other versions, other this version in the gospel said that he was healing people and teaching at the same time. Um, and so just to like make this real for you guys in this moment, Jesus is grieving. OK, he just lost his cousin. His disciples come back. They are tired. OK, they didn't have they haven't ate because, you know, they didn't bring food with them. They probably walked far distances. You know, it's actually pretty draining to be teaching people, healing people. Um, and they are probably exhausted. They're dirty. They ain't have no clothes. Um, and so Jesus, you know, he wants to depart from them, not only to he wants to go to a deserted place, not only to you know, give them rest. Cause he said, let's rest for a while. Yeah. I haven't ate for a while. Let's go somewhere quiet and let's just rest. And, but he also kind of wants to go off by himself because it, it says in other versions that even with, within the des deserted place, Jesus went off into a mountain to grieve basically to be by himself with the loss of his cousin. The disciples are tired y'all. And to see, you know, other people follow you because the most who saw them leaving, they were like, wait, hold on that's Jesus. Like we got to go where Jesus is going. And so they followed them. And so they went to a place expecting to rest and get something to eat. But then they got all these people following them. And then Jesus is like compassionate. Cause you know, he's Jesus. And he's like, you know what? I have to teach these people. They're, they're seeking rest. They're seeking peace. They're seeking healing. I cannot because of my own grief, because of my own like you know, because he was in the flesh, too, and he felt what we felt. So he was probably tired, too. But he didn't let that stop him because he knew that he was on a mission. He knew what his purpose was. And so he was like, I'm compassionate about these people because I see that these people are lost. So he decides that despite what he was feeling, he was going to continue to preach to these people. But the disciples, they're like, oh, my God, bruh. Like... I can't do this. Like, I can't do this. Like, we cannot do this. And so this is actually, in, we're still in Mark. This is how the disciples responded to the multitudes coming and Jesus preaching to them and stuff. They said, when the day was now far spent, meaning it's nighttime now, Jesus has been preaching and, and healing all day. His disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place. This is the place you brought us to rest. And already the hour is late. It's nighttime. I'm ready to go to bed. Like, this is too much. Come on. Let's speed it, speed it, speed it, speed it up. Send them away. That they may go into the surrounding country and village and buy themselves bread. Because, like, it's, it's mealtime. We're hungry. For they have nothing to eat. So, like, it sounds compassionate, right? They're thinking, oh, you're like, oh, the disciples are thinking about the people. They're like, oh, these people came far away. They have nothing to eat. But really, they was probably in their flesh. And they, like, send them away, like... We ain't got enough for these people. Like, we barely got food. So how are we going to feed all these people? We're trying to eat. They're trying to eat. We ain't got no food. They're expecting food. Like, send them away. Jesus was like, Jesus knows this because Jesus knows you. Like, you ask for stuff, he knows what you're really asking for. You be saying one thing, he knows what you're really saying. So Jesus was like, but he answered them and said to them, you give them something to eat. Period. Point blank. Message. You give them something to eat. Okay, they answered him. They said to him, "Shall we go and buy two hundred denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat?" Okay, I I kind of read this as like they was being snarky. They like you just ask us, you just really like you just first off, first off, hold on, hold on, hold on. You you just told us to embark on this journey. Collect no food, collect no money from this from this journey, right? We come to this place to rest. We get no rest because people come in. And now we have like 5,000 people surrounding you, and you're telling us to feed them, and we have no food. So, like, their snarky response was like, okay. 
shall we use this this little money we have to go buy all this bread? Like that's bread is expensive. How are we gonna buy five thousand loaves of bread with only two hundred denarii? Make that make sense, Jesus. Make that make sense. So that is Mark's version. But when you're reading one scene from one apostle, say you're reading something from Matthew, that same scene is recorded in the other three gospels in a different way. And so when you read all four of them, I know it's tedious to read the same thing. You can actually start to picture how the scene actually went. And it becomes like a movie in your head. And that really helps me out sometimes when I'm studying for myself. So that's just a suggestion. Take it as you will. John has a more detailed version of this scene of feeding the 5,000. Actually, Mark, um, Matthew and Luke, they kind of, they're kind of like just briefly going over it and their, 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 um, accounts are pretty the same. So we're actually not going to read theirs. So have Mark's version in your head while we read John's version of this scene. Right. So this is John. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went off the mountain and there he sat with his disciples. Remember, he was sitting. He went up to the, the deserted place, the mountains to grieve. And because the disciples were tired, that's what we learned from Mark. And so he was like, come on, let's go rest. And so that's what they are. The multitude followed him because they just saw him just do miracles and stuff. And they like, I want to follow this man. This man is something. He's something. There's something different about this man. So we're going to follow him. Now, the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Passover was near, y'all. This was time during Passover, people getting ready for Passover. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and he, seeing a great multitude coming towards him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. I want to pause here. Remember, I said keep Luke 9 verses one through three in your head, in the back of your mind. And that verse was him sending the disciples out with no provision. He said, don't take anything with you. Just take what you have on you right now. Don't take anything in pre preparation for this trip. Just go. Right. And they do it. They have nothing. And yet they healed a lot of people. They taught a lot of people. And they're probably pretty excited about the things that they could do with little to nothing. Right. And so I feel like this moment where he turns to Philip and he said, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? Jesus knows the situation. He knows the disciples have nothing, that they only have 200 denarii. They don't have enough money to afford to buy food for 5,000 people. So it says that this was a test that Jesus was giving to his disciples. The disciples journey was not because he chose them to do his disciples and do his work. That was a lesson for the disciples. He wanted to see if the disciples would notice that you can have little to nothing and still do the work of God. You don't need preparation. You don't need um, you don't need an abundance of money. You don't need an abundance of clothes to do the work of God. He is the provider. He will provide you with what you need and you can get it done with little to nothing. And so here he is trying to see if they if they learned that lesson from their journey. And so he turns to, to Philip and he's like, OK, testing time. Where are we going to get the bread to feed these people? And and Philip says 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may have a little. So Philip's like, OK, we have two denarii, but that's not enough. They are still not getting that Jesus can work with little. OK, they're still not understanding that Jesus is Jesus. I feel like they're still like they still don't understand who Jesus is. OK, so he's looking out the outside. He's looking at how much money he has. He's focused on the fact that he has little to no money. So how is he going to how is he going to provide? That is something we do. We always look at our circumstances. We see how little we have. And then we just think that we just see no solution to the problem based off what we see. Right. And then one of his disciples, it says, this is the next verse. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad, a little boy here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? 
So we see here a characteristic of Andrew that we pointed out. Andrew is resourceful, okay? He was the one that brought the little boy forth. He brought attention to the fact, okay, we have 200 denarii, but we also have this little boy with um, five loaves of bread and two small fish. Can you imagine what the disciples probably looked, how they looked when Andrew brought that forth? Like, bruh. What? What are we going to do with five loaves of bread and two small fish? This is the difference we see with Andrew. This is the faith that faithful obedience, that eagerness, this is this is why Jesus chose Andrew, okay? His faith. He followed Jesus without hesitation. He did not have to be convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. He understands who Jesus is, and a little to an extent, because he still had a little bit of doubt. He understood the assignment. He understood the mission. He knew without a doubt, okay? We only have this little, but if I was to bring this little to Jesus, Jesus can make this into something beyond what we can see. And that is what Jesus is telling us to do. That is what we can learn from Andrew. Bring forth what little you have. I struggle with this, especially with this YouTube channel. I always think I have to have the best gear. I have to have money. I have to have this. I have to have that in order to do the work of God. But Jesus is calling out to you right now. Forget all that. I have given you enough. Like when he told them, when he sent them out with what they have on. He sent them out with what they already had and they were able to, with his power and authority, cast out demons, cure the sick and to preach and to gain a mass following for Jesus. And in this moment, that is what we can learn from Andrew. Jesus took the loaves and he gave thanks and he distributed them to the disciples and the disciples gave it to those who were sitting down. In the Luke version, it says that each of the 5,000 were paired up into 50s. So they went around and they had enough. And not only did they had enough, they had some left over to fill 12 baskets. Okay. And Jesus said, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. That is basically saying, remember this moment. Jesus like, remember this moment. Remember when you gave me five loaves of bread and two small fish and I gave you back not only did I feed the people that you were, that not only were you able to feed other people, do my work, my work and will, you also have some left over. You had more than what you came to me with. And that was only through the power and the authority of Jesus. So from this lesson, we can learn, come to Jesus with what you have. Don't worry about having much, having many. Come to with what little you have. And through Jesus, you can leave with much more the next key moment is actually pretty small and this is only this moment is only recorded in john chapter 12 verses 20 through 22 now among those and this is the esv version this is the easy to read now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some greeks so these came to philip who was from bethesda and galilee and asked him sir we wish to see jesus philip went and told andrew and then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. So this scene is actually um, during the time of the Passover festival. So it is shortly before Ju Jesus is crucified. The Greeks mentioned here were probably most likely Gentiles. These and Gentiles were people who were not born um, of the Jewish heritage. They didn't know anything about the word of God. They didn't know of a God. They were probably worshiping like the Greek goddesses and all that stuff. This is very prevalent during the Roman Empire. So these are people just like, these are basically the outsiders of Jewish faith. These are the people that the Pharisees and the chief leaders of the of the Jews, they didn't want any association with these people. They thought they were dumb. They thought they were sinners. They thought they were filth. And so they didn't want anything to do with them. They tried to keep their word of God sacred for themselves. And they did not want the good news of Jesus to spread out to those who, who really needed it. So these Greeks knew of the Passover, you know, the Passover festival, that's when every, all the Jews, Jewish men would come down to Jerusalem. They would make that trip and they would basically like give sacrifice and, you know, give worship to God. And so somehow these Greeks knew of this festival. And so they were like, Jesus is going to be there, so we're going down to Jerusalem, y'all. Let's pack up our bags and let's go. Because we heard about this Jesus. Of course, Jesus is doing all these miracles and stuff, and word is spreading. So they come down, and they like, oh, y'all y'all are disciples of Jesus. We wish to see him. Where he at? Philip, instead of like, I'm assuming Philip and Andrew were like, 
they were um, buddies when they were when Jesus sent out the twelve. So you know he paired them up in two. So they are probably buddies, Andrew and Philip. So they come through right. Philip recognizes that Andrew has discernment. He sees potentials in people, and he has a knack for bringing people. Um, making that connection with Jesus, he's probably like, you know, softening him up because, you know, it's nervous when you you about to meet the Messiah. Like, you know, and it takes a skill to really introduce other people to other people, especially when you have so many different personalities. And so Philip recognized this to Andrew. And so and Philip says, Andrew, like these people want to meet Jesus. He's warm, he's inviting, and he brings them to Jesus. And so that is a characteristic that we mentioned earlier that we see in this moment with Andrew. Now we get to a, a part that I know you guys were anticipating. Oh. We get to Andrew's demise. Okay. So um, I really want it, wanted to just give a little back, background information on w the lives of the disciples after Jesus ascended into heaven and left them with the Holy Spirit and with the task of spreading his good news through the Holy Spirit. You can actually kind of see what happened afterwards in the book of Acts and like, you know, with Paul interactions with Paul and all that and um I do want to give a disclaimer and say that like the stories you hear about the apostles were all things that were written after um centuries after the bible was composed and stuff so really you should get all of your information your your truthful information from the bible and that's it Anything outside of that, always read with caution. Make sure you do your research. Make sure that it is factual and that it aligns with the word of God, that it doesn't contradict the word of God. Because if it does, then it's then it's not true. Then that's point blank period because, because the word of God is truth. And anything that contradicts it or, you know, deviates from the true message is not true. So make sure you read this with a grain of salt. This narrative that I'm about to give is about Andrew's crucifixion. And I'm just going to briefly say it after Jesus ascends to heaven and, you know, gives the Holy Spirit to the apostles. And you can read more about that in the book of Acts about their deeds and things. As the early Christian church began to spread over the Roman Empire, Andrew, one of the first disciples, took it upon himself to travel far distances. And so in his mis missionary journeys, he traveled far um, to various regions, including um, Scythia. I think I'm saying this right. I'm going to put the word down below, like Scythia, which today you will recognize as modern day Ukraine and Russia. He went to Asia Minor and eventually Greece. It was in Greece where he was in the city of Patris. Again, I'm going to put the, the, the spelling of the word down there. I don't know if I'm saying these words right. In the region of Achaia, um, and that is where Andrew was crucified. This is um, the story that is behind his crucifixion. Again, take this with a grain of salt. Don't know if it's true or not. This was recorded in something that is titled The Acts of Andrew, which was written by historians centuries after the Bible's composition. So he was in the city of pa Patras, right? And he was um, preaching the message of Jesus Christ, and he was converting many to the Christian faith. Um, and so he was attracting a lot of attention. And this also got the attention of the local Roman authorities. We see this when Jesus was on earth and he started to preach and perform miracles that not only did he gain good attention from the masses, but he also gained attention from the chief rulers and the Pharisees and people who were trying to kill him and the Roman authorities. And this threatened their position. They're like, this dude is getting too famous and he could change the minds of the people we're ruling over. So he needs to go. One of those people that he converted was a woman by the name of Max Milla, who was the wife of the Roman proconsul of the city of Patris. So a proconsul was just somebody who was like over city, overseeing the city that they were proconsul of. You know, Rome was really huge. So they had to divide, meaning they had to set people in positions to oversee various regions of Rome because it was just too big for one person to be focused on so the ruler of this city in particular his wife was you know heard Andrew preaching converted to Christianity and so he was enraged that he lost his wife's allegiance to his pagan faith that his wife was now following Christianity um, this probably brought freedom to her this probably brought her hope and he didn't like that okay um, this man was named Agates, Agates, I don't know. We don't care. We don't care. Agates, enraged by his wife's conversion, demands that Andrew um, renounce his faith 
or die. You know, reject Jesus Christ or perish. Andrew, following in the footsteps of Jesus, was like, No, I am going to die for Christ. I walked with Christ. I had, I've seen his miracles. I've seen, you know, I've heard his teachings. I've been preaching his word for a long time. I've seen the power of God. I've seen, I have the Holy Spirit. So you can kill me all you want. I'm going to die for Jesus. Agates commanded, um, basically declared that he he's going to die, basically. He condemned him to be crucified, hoping to silence him and, you know, silence his Andrew's followers that he got. This was not an ordinary crucifixion. He wasn't crucified like Jesus was. The way that Ju Jesus was crucified was basically typical Roman crucifixion. But Agates, in his cruelty, he ordered that Andrew be tied to the cross instead of nailed. And the cross wasn't even a cross. It was an X. It was like an X-shaped cross. And you can actually see this symbol. Anytime you look up um, St. Andrew or uh, Andrew the Apostle, you see a symbol of an X. It's because he was crucified on an X-shaped cross. And this today is known as St. Andrew's, Andrew's cross, an X-shaped cross. Agates chose this, this form of, and, of, of crucifixion, you know, to mock Jesus, to mock the faith. Um, to mock Andrew and so he was just all up in his feelings and stuff about that and he was kept on that cross for many days uh, for two days to be exact he hung on the cross and he was basically and that's how his his ending was not very pleasant mm. the acts of Andrew goes on to say that this is something that he said as he was on the cross again we don't really know if that's true or factual or not but this is what it says this is what Andrew cried out while he was on the cross O oh, cross, most welcome and long anticipated, I come to you with a willing mind full of joy and desire. I have long sought and expected you. Now you have been found by my prayers and you are ready for my longing soul. Receive me into your arms, taking me from among men and present me to my master, that he who redeemed me on you may receive me by you. Powerful final words. Um from a very faithful a very resourceful energetic eager um person and as sad as it is you can just applaud <laughs> applaud for this man yes he did his thing the first disciple what can we learn from andrew's life be faithful okay faithful obedience um e eager to follow jesus one lesson for sure is that moment with the feeding the five thousand. you don't need a lot okay come as you are come with the little you have and god can do an abundance of things there probably wouldn't be any christianity in the regions of ukraine russia and all the other regions that he traveled to without his him traveling there and preaching the word of god and standing firm in his faith and so that is what Jesus calls us to do as well. What about your willingness to bring others to Jesus? What have you done, just like Andrew, to preach the message of Jesus Christ to other people? What have you done to bring them to Jesus? And what can you do now? Remember, you ain't got to start big. You don't have to come with all this big, grand you know, preaching, you know, on sermons at the church and stuff. It can be as simple as a small conversation. It could be a small invite to a church gathering. It could be a small invite to a non-church gathering. You just bring up Jesus or you just talk about your story. It doesn't have to be big. You can come with little and God can make make it to a big, big thing. Who have you brought closer to Jesus and how can Andrew's example inspire you today? Leave a comment below um, if you also in your research about Andrew find something else interesting comment about that as well if this really healed you if you found this interesting make sure you leave a like because that helps with the algorithm share this with someone who needs to hear it share this with someone who do who don't really need to hear it but you just thought okay this might be interesting for them share it make sure you hit that subscribe button and that you hit the notification bell so that you don't miss a single story. I'm going to be doing all 12 of the disciples. This is a part of my series. Next episode, we will be talking about Simon Peter going, out, going over his life, his key moments, and the lessons we can learn from him. All right, y'all. Well, this was nice. Have love, have peace, have faith like Andrew. And let God do his part. Peace.